Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to another timely conversation from the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. I'm Cliff May, FDD's founder and president. We're honored to host Indo-PACOM Commander Admiral Phil Davidson for a discussion on how to reverse America's eroding military edge in the Pacific. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, has called China the main challenge to U.S. national security over the next 50 to 100 years. And Secretary of Defense Mark Esper named the Indo-Pacific America's priority theater. Yet earlier this year, Indo-Pacific Command warned Congress that it lacks the resources and capabilities necessary to fulfill its mission in the region. The command warned that the military balance within the region is becoming more unfavorable and risks inviting aggression from Beijing. Today, Admiral Davidson will discuss these challenges and what must be done to protect American interests and deter aggression from Beijing. This event is hosted by FDG's Center on Military and Political Power, which seeks to promote understanding of the defense strategies, policies, and capabilities necessary to deter and defeat threats to the freedom, security, and prosperity of America and America's allies. This event is also hosted by FDD's China program, whose experts work closely with FDD's three centers on American power to leverage economic, financial, military, political, cyber, and technology tools to expose and challenge the full scope of the challenge from the Chinese Communist Party. CMPP is led by former National Security Advisor, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, who serves as chair of CMPP's Board of Advisors. CMPP is run by Brad Bowman, the center's senior director, who will moderate today's session. Brad serves as National Security Advisor to members of the Senate Armed Services and Foreign Relations Committees, and was for more than 15 years an active duty U.S. Army officer. During that time, he was both a Black Hawk pilot and an assistant professor at West Point. As many of our audience members know, FDD is a research institute exclusively focused on national security and foreign policy. We are nonpartisan and accept no funds from foreign governments, never have, never will. Today's program is one of many we host throughout the year. For more information on all of our work and our areas of focus, we encourage you to visit our website. It's fdd.org. We also encourage you to follow us on Twitter, just at FDD. I'm now pleased to turn the floor over to my colleague, Brad Bowman, to introduce Admiral Davidson and begin the discussion. Thank you, Cliff. I wanna thank everyone who is watching. I hope you and your families are safe and well. And I especially want to thank Admiral Phil Davidson for joining me for this discussion. Admiral Davidson is the 25th commander of the United States Indo-Pacific Command, America's oldest and largest military combatant command based in Hawaii. U.S. Indo-PACOM includes 380,000 soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, Coast Guardsmen, and Department of Defense civilians. responsible for all U.S. military activities in the Indo-Pacific, covering 14 time zones, more than 50% of the world's population, and 36 nations. And for our purposes, and for purposes of our discussion today, that includes the People's Republic of China. A native of St. Louis, Missouri, Admiral Davidson is a uh, is a 1982 graduate of the United States Naval Academy, that other academy in Annapolis. He has commanded at all levels and is a surface warfare officer who has deployed across the globe in frigates, destroyers, cruisers, and aircraft carriers. Admiral, welcome. Thank you for your decades of service to our country, and thank you for making time to join me for this important discussion. Thank you, Brad. Indeed, a pleasure. Look forward to the discussion. Absolutely. There's a lot we can discuss. Uh, we have a little less than an hour, so with your permission, let's get started. All um, right. All right. Admiral, like many, I, I, it's my view that the People's Republic of China uh, represents the preeminent international threat to the United States. China falls within your area of responsibility, and you understand the China challenge arguably as well as anyone in the Department of Defense. So what are China's security objectives in the Indo-Pacific, in your view, and how do those contrast with the security objectives of the United States and our partners in the region? Uh, thank you, Brad, uh, for that. I, I appreciate your articulation of the threat. Indeed, I believe China is the strategic threat of the century when it comes to the United States, but really to certainly the free world. I think it's important first, though, to articulate what we are for. And when I say we, I mean the United States. And the United States is for a free and open Indo-Pacific. That has been well articulated by the president, the vice president, 
Secretary of State, numerous Secretaries of Defense. And um, I'm noting uh, strategic convergence around the U.S. government and certainly across our network of allies and partners, uh, because you've seen um, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, uh, India put forth similar visions. Indeed, ASEAN, under Indonesia's leadership, put forth uh, what they call a free, open, and inclusive uh, Pacific vision. Um, so what do we mean by that? By free, we mean in terms of traditional security and in terms of our values and political systems. Free societies respect individual rights and liberties, the promotion of good governance, and uh, adherence to the shared values of the UN Charter and the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Free also means nations fundamentally do not have to choose who they partner with, who they trade with, especially out of fear or coercion. They are free to exercise their sovereignty. When we say open, it, it, to me, it goes all the way back to the agreement between President Roosevelt and Churchill at the Atlantic Charter, that open means open seas and airways so that all nations have rights uh, to markets, to resources, and to trade with others. And according to the free and open Indo-Pacific vision, nations are able to have open investment environments, uh, the security and intellectual property rights, uh, and fair and reciprocal trade. Um, and it also means free access to, to all the continents. So I would put cyberspace and um, space in that as well, uh, because that access brings mutual benefit uh, and mutual understanding uh, to all nations. China has a much different vision, and in the shortest words, it's a closed and authoritarian vision. Um, they have a very pernicious whole of nation approach to the region, and that that includes an immense propaganda machine that is meant to undermine allies and partners. It includes wolf warrior and mask diplomacy, where they seek um, uh, agreements not to challenge uh, Chinese equities in order to benefit from those things. And of course, it, it includes a very pernicious economic approach where they use the corruption of business elites and governmental elites um, and undermine other nations' sovereignty with, uh, with uh, projects and uh, funding vehicles um, that threaten the, the security of nations, whether it's free economic zones in other areas in which China wants to control the security and access to, or whether it's the very poor quality um, uh, kind of developmental projects that they've been pushing under the Belt and Road Initiative. One only need to look to Western China to understand what is happening to the Uyghurs, to understand uh, what's happening in Hong Kong, to what's happening in the South China Sea, what's happening in Tibet, to what's happening along the line of actual control, to understand that China's vision for the future is not about a free and open Indo-Pacific. It's about creating an environment in which Asia would be subjected to Chinese determination and Chinese law and a Chinese belief in authoritarianism. And I think that's a really effective laydown of kind of what we and our allies and partners stand for and, and what Beijing stands for. And I'm so glad you made the point uh, that uh, my words, not yours, that if we want to understand what kind of uh, international community we would have with Beijing calling the shots, we need to simply look how Beijing treats their own people. Why would they treat foreigners any better than they treat uh, minorities in their own country? And I think you said that very nicely. I would note that the uh, the recent Quad meeting, you know, the free and open Indo-Pacific values, priorities, rule of law that you emphasized, it was echoed not only by uh, our Secretary of State, but also by his uh, his uh, counterparts from Australia, Japan, and India. And what a powerful statement that is. Indeed, I agree. I'm quite encouraged by a ministerial level meeting um, of India, Japan, Australia, and the United States. That's fabulous trajectory. As you know better than me, uh, Beijing is pursuing the most aggressive, in my view, military modernization in the history of the People's Republic of China. As the top U.S. military officer that threat, or, uh, rivalry if we're being generous, threat if we're being more realistic in my view, can you provide an overview of China's military modernization effort and, and why it matters? Why does this matter for the average American? Yeah, I, I think it's important um, 
to, to talk about what that development is. And thank you for the question, Brad. I, you know, there's four elements in which they're greatly advancing their military and security apparatus. You know, first is in modernization. They are developing fourth and fifth generation fighters, modern warships, modern submarines. Um, they, they are continue to develop and carry a profound advantage when it comes to ballistic missiles and cruise missiles launched from the air, from their own territory, and from the sea. Um, and the numbers of those things have changed dramatically. Um, you know, the Navy's been moving from a 316, uh, sh our Navy, uh, from a 316 ship Navy down to about 295 with the ambition to be larger. Uh, China's been absolutely going in the other direction since the turn of the century, and in the last eight years um, has greatly advanced their numbers. Um, I would also say they have very modern capability and again are developing and advancing space and cyber capability to a great degree. Second thing they're doing is training. So um, they have a very protracted exercise uh, program. They're in the middle of a national level exercise right now. Uh, you saw uh, demonstrations of ballistic missile use. Um, we're seeing uh, joint uh, capability being employed, a preparation of amphibious forces and uh, preparations for amphibious exercises and things like that. Um, it's bringing together all these elements and modernization things that I just articulated. Third is um, they've advanced into a joint um, structure for their command and control. They have five theater commands now, and uh, they're, they're starting to replicate uh, the kind of uh, joint structure that the United States has demonstrated is so powerful uh, around the world, and they are exercising it profoundly. And then lastly, they're putting together the combat systems and support uh, that's required to do all this. This is sensing, this is um, you know an overseas intelligence apparatus, this is logistics, this is sustainment, um, this is um, munitions uh, support and those kind of things. Um, those, those four represent how they are advancing that capability um, and the challenge it's presenting uh, not to the United States alone, uh, but indeed to the international community. That's great, thank you. I, I have a question on behalf of uh, Tom Bowman at NPR that fits in nicely here. Here's the question from Tom. Uh, in terms of the regional activities of the People's Liberation Army, uh, he's interested in what is new. Are we just seeing more ships and aircraft patrolling farther afield, or are you seeing something more than that? What is new in the South China Sea and elsewhere, or more directly asked, what keeps you up at night in terms of the PLA's activity? Well, it's, it's certainly what we're seeing is um, more uh, Chinese operations farther afield. Uh, it's reflective of deployment state of the Gulf of Aden. The, the 35th uh, Naval Task Force that was out there is uh, returning to China right now, and the 36th is in place. That's an element of it. Uh, but what you're actually seeing is uh, much more intensive operations within the first island chain um, and in and around Taiwan, the South China Sea, the East China Sea, um, and our first island uh, uh, chain allies as well as um, Taiwan. Um, again, that is representative of joint, all domain, uh, and more intensive operations. It includes more uh, bomber flights uh, from their H-6s. It includes uh, deployments of fighter and airborne early warning aircraft and other intelligence gathering aircraft to South China Sea militarized features. It includes violations of the Taiwan, uh, excuse me, Taiwan ADIS, uh, the Air Defense Identification Zone of uh, PLA aircraft. Um, and um, it includes harassment of other nation fishing vessels, uh, oil exploration vessels, uh, uh, territories uh, uh, like the Senkakus, uh, and, and on and on like that. So you're seeing, uh, you know, an increase globally um, uh, outside the first island chain, but the focus of their effort and where it's become much more intense in the quickest amount of time is within the first island chain. That's really helpful. And again, with deference to you, it seems like almost any direction we look from China, whether it's on the border with India, 
whether it's in the South China Sea, whether it is in the first island chain uh, and, and, and uh, near Taiwan, and almost in every direction, we, it seems to me we see incredibly aggressive behavior on the, on, on the part of Beijing and the PLA. Um, speaking of that, in a report to Congress earlier this year known as the Section 1253 Assessment, Indo-Pacific Command, your command, wrote the following, and I think it's worth uh, quoting it because it's, to me, it's, I think every American needs to hear this, quote, the greatest danger for the United States is the erosion of conventional deterrence. Without a valid and convincing conventional deterrent, China and Russia will be emboldened to take action in the region to supplant U.S. interests. In the report, your command made clear that is exactly what is happening. Indo-PACOM assesses that the military balance of power with China continues to become, quote, more unfavorable and warns the United States is accumulating, quote, additional risks that may embolden our adversaries to attempt to unilaterally change the status quo before the U.S. could have muster an effective response, close quote. Um, Admiral, what do you, why do you believe, rather, why do you believe the military balance of power with China is becoming more uh, unfavorable? And what are the consequences of that if un uh, unaddressed? I mean, you've spoken to their modernization program, you've spoken a bit uh, to their activities, but when we tie all that all together, uh, can you just speak to this, this shifting balance of power and what the consequences of that might be if it's unaddressed? Yeah, I, I would say the pace of that change, um, and especially in, in the last eight years during uh, President Xi's uh, tenure, um, the pace of that change is what's led to the statement that you articulated in, in, the, in the 1253 report. And, and it also has to do with the capability change that's happening. They are developing and fielding fifth generation fighters. They are developing and fielding um, hypersonic uh, developing hypersonic weapons and testing hypersonic weapons. Um, they are developing and fielding maneuvering ballistic missiles. Um, they are developing and fielding more advanced command and control systems. The pace of that change with a higher amount of capability is changing the equation for us and for our allies and partners in the region. Uh, we have to be sensitive to the pace of that change and adjust accordingly. No, that's great. And a little, you know, unsolicited commentary from me for the viewers and no need to respond to Adam unless you want to is, you know, I hope Americans are listening because if, you know, if you're old enough to remember the Gulf War, you know, where the United States took months to uh, basically send all the equipment with, that we needed into the, the, the Gulf region and create, you know, a mountain of steel and then uh, have that be unchallenged by our adversaries, no, no serious, uh, you know, missile threat uh, to that, and then to commence the operation on a timeline of our choosing. Those days are over. Those are days are over, and and we face an adversary now that has capabilities that is really forcing us to relook how we fight. And here we have, you know, the, our top uh, commander in the region sounding the alarm. And and I hope I hope Americans are listening. Uh, you don't have to respond to that unless you want to, Admiral. But that's I, I felt compelled to say that. Um, yeah, please go ahead, bro. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in response to some of the issues you've raised, uh, Congress appears poised uh, to establish an Indo-Pacific or Pacific Deterrence Initiative in the forthcoming National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, that's the annual defense bill that uh, that they have passed for 55 plus years. In the meantime, Dave Brown and Politico, another question uh, from, from the media, is interested in what steps you are already taking. So we all hope, I hope, that Congress actually does pass this deterrence initiative. I think it's absolutely needed. But in the meantime, Dave Brown and Politico wants to know what steps you're taking to address this these unfavorable trends. And, and I would add to that, if I may, without loading you up too much, what do you believe is specifically required to reverse this unfavorable trend and defend our interests and values in the Indo-Pacific from a military perspective? Yeah, we, we have to demonstrate the capability, the capacity and the will uh, to defend U.S. homeland. And, and that includes the continental United States, certainly us uh, here in Hawaii and Alaska and the U.S. territories um, across the Western Pacific and the Southern Pacific. Um, and we have a strategy to do that in the Indo-Pacific. It has four elements. You know, the first is to take advantage of our joint lethality, continue to develop that lethality. Um, that includes advancing uh, the interoperability of the fifth generation fighters we're bringing in, advancing our integrated air and missile defense, and getting into the long range precision fires game with the networks, excuse me, with the sensors and networks that help support them. 
Secondly, we have to enhance our design and posture. You know, we rely heavily on a relatively small cadre of permanently uh, deployed forward base forces, but we also use forward rotation forces. Um, we have to in, in, um, improve their ability to interop to interoperate as joint forces and in multi-domain structures. I'm quite encouraged uh, by all of the service visions for advancing their forces, and we need to take advantage of that. But it also means taking advantage of our posture forward. Um, you've seen some of the advocacy we put in place for Guam, uh, the Commonwealth of the Northern uh, Marianas Islands. Um, but it also means, you know, where are the bases and places um, that take our orientation away from a Northeast Asia focus and really give it an Indo-Pacific focus um, over the next few years and take advantage of, uh, of those things. I'm not looking to build little Americas all over the Western Pacific, um, but there are critical places in which we need to improve our, our access, uh, our intelligence sharing, our information sharing with others in order to enhance our posture in the region and put forth uh, a better deterrent. The third thing I would say is we have to strengthen our allies and partners. Um, I'm quite encouraged by the quad meeting that you mentioned earlier. Um, we've, there are other elements uh, that are being exercised in a whole of government uh, posture that include uh, meetings of like-minded partners, those who are interested in the development uh, within Oceania, the Pacific Island chain, uh, Southeast Asia, for example, um, not just in the military sphere, but um, uh, um, in, in the developmental whole of government things, um, as well as, you know, helping ensure that our allies and partners um, purchase the kind of equipments that drive together our interoperability and compatibility. I've been quite encouraged, you know, we've been a long partner with uh, Japan and Korea, for example, at ballistic missile defense. We're a partner with uh, those nations and Australia, for example, with fifth gen fighters and other elements of integrated air missile defense. I'm encouraged by the kind of things that uh, India is starting to buy when it comes to US elements as well. Um, but if we can strengthen our alliances and partnerships, um, I would say more than any other of the four things I'm describing to you, you know, our alliance and partnership network is something that uh, China can't really count. Um, and then the last element, which I think is also important, that really brings life to the other three, is enhancing our exercises out here, our innovation and our experimentation. Uh, it's a major agenda for me this year. Um, you know, uh, first, we have to be able to leverage the joint service exercises we have. There really isn't capacity for more in terms of dollars or time. So as we've been adapting and evolving our systems, we have to make sure that these exercises adapt and evolve as well. Secondly, we have to get after what is really an exquisite range network out here, not just US, but the Jay Park in Alaska, uh, the extraordinary ranges we have at Nellis and in Fallon in Nevada, the Southern California op areas, right here at PMRF off Kauai, uh, the Oaxaca Law uh, training area, the PTA in the Big Island, Kwajalein, Guam, the CJMT that we're going to build in CNMI, and then Japan, and then what Australia has in uh, Northwest Australia. These are really exquisite training ranges that bring size and the potential for capacity. Unfortunately, they've been developed by training, or excuse me, by service training regimes or by testing regimes and don't really bring, you know, weren't really designed to bring forth the joint force and demonstrate joint capability. Further, you know, they were really baseline back, you know, third generation, fourth generation aircraft area, um, you know, pre-missile defense and things like that. We've got to build in a live virtual constructive network. We've been partnering with uh, um, an FFRDC to help us to think through what is the most efficient, cost-effective, but effective methodology to do that so we can bring together not only the U.S. joint force, and exercise an Indo-Pacific warfighting uh, concept, but bring together our allies and partners and help advance their capability um, uh, and their interoperability with us um, so that we truly have a deterrent posture out here in the region. 
Well, that's a great way to highlight that, you know, the kind of readiness that it's so important uh, to give you to enable you to do your job depends not just on fielding the most modern weapon systems, but making sure that our, our we have the right units, that they're properly trained and integrated. And, and that depends on the exercises and the infrastructure. And that's one reason why I think the uh, the Pacific Deterrence Initiative is so important because the, you know, the, the weapons, as someone who worked a bit in the Senate, the weapon systems are going to often have the political support they need, but we also need that oversight and attention on the things that are a little less glamorous, like the infrastructure and, and the exercise and the training ranges that allow you to put it all together, as you just described. Um, so I'd like to kind of, if I could, Admiral, uh, dig into a, a, what something that may seem uh, quite specific uh, to some of the viewers, but the more that I study it and the more that I that I learn, uh, the more uh, pivotal and even strategic or grand strategic it becomes, and that is the issue of Guam. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in, in the media about this. I've written a bit on it. You've talked about it more importantly. What is, for the average American who's never been to Guam and you know might struggle to find it on a map, what is the strategic importance of Guam to you as the, the uh, top uh, combatant commander in the region? Yeah, well, first, it's U.S. Homer. Uh, Guam are U.S. citizens, and they disproportionately, excuse me, disproportionately serve uh, at a greater per capita rate uh, than almost all of our states in the Union, in the United States military, uh, which I think is uh, very critical to have. We have very important um, uh, strategic facilities in Guam as well from the U.S. viewpoint. There's an extraordinary harbor there at Apra Harbor where we have U.S. Uh, attack submarines home ported uh, and the maintenance, sustainment, and munition structure that supports it. We also have just, you know, the most uh, profound uh, airfield in the region uh, capable of employing everything from our, you know, smallest fighter planes all the way through logistics, uh, lift, tankers, uh, all the way up through our entire bomber suite of capability. Um, you know, that's important to have there. And there hasn't been a lot of put, uh, a lot of thought put into defending that apparatus. Um, so having uh, the right defensive posture for Guam to protect U.S. citizens, um, to enable uh, the protection also of the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands, and to facilitate nearly all of our multi-domain operations across the Western Pacific is critically important to me. No, that's great. And I'm glad you started, Admiral, with the, you know, they're American citizens, right? That's the first and most important reason. Uh, we we defend our own and, and uh, we have uh, 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 tens of thousands of American citizens, civilians living there, and we also have uh, other Americans deployed there as well. So that's, I'm so glad you started with that key point. Uh, you've repeatedly emphasized in uh, congressional testimony and elsewhere that to do that, to do what you just described, uh, to defend Guam and all that it means to us is, uh, it requires 360 degree persistent and integrated air defense capability. And you've even said that that is, in your command has said, that's your number one priority. Why? The answer starts to come out from what we've said already based on what the PLA is doing, but just to really drive it home, why is, why is air and missile defense in Guam uh, your top priority? Well, I mean, we started to talk about it earlier in terms of the threat we're seeing um, uh, PLA forces um, move farther afield, right? I focused the beginning on First Island Chain, but we are indeed seeing deployments of surface ships, um, bombers, submarines, you know, well out beyond the First Island Chain. So that's an important factor to keep in mind. Secondly, we have all this important uh, U.S. military and security capability um, in the form of our own submarines and, and Air Force assets there. And I neglected to mention earlier that uh, the Marine Corps um, just established Camp Blas, uh, the first new uh, Marine Corps camp base um, established in the Pacific since 1952. Um, and they have a great ambition to station U.S. Marines there. Uh, that are going to be critically important to our posture um, and our warfighting capability um, within the first, second island chains, indeed across the whole of the Indo-Pacific as well. Um, so it's important to note that the threat now has moved, uh, the threat and our own capability, the threat has moved to kind of a 360 degree posture, and we are putting a larger amount of our capability set um, there as well. Um, persistence 
is very, very important here. Um, and when you think about the ballistic missile defense that's been put in place in Guam so far, uh, it was really designed to handle a rogue ballistic missile threat from North Korea. You know, a single, maybe two shots, um, and a threat vector of only about 120 degrees. As I articulated, um, if you have Chinese deployments around it, bombers coming uh, from China, surface ships and uh, um, uh, PLA submarines capable of shooting uh, cruise missiles, you're going to have to come up with a 360 uh, degree defense in order to defend it. And that's great. I think that's worth uh, just for the the lay person listening uh, that it's 360 degree uh, threat and needed defense because, like you said, uh, we have vessels that can be sailing all around and uh, firing from any direction as, and bombers as well. So it's not just ground launched uh, missiles that we have to worry about. And that's why it needs to be 360, presumably. Um, Admiral, there was a uh, Reuters recently reported, uh, uh, released a story describing a two minute video. Uh, that was intriguing uh, from the uh, People's Liberations Army Air Force uh, depicting a simulated attack, uh, which appears to be on Anderson Air Force Base in Guam. Just from a uh, you know from an American perspective, this video seems to me to be a quite belligerent and provocative threat against our country, our citizens, as you've emphasized, and service members, and specifically Guam. Uh, what do you take from that video? Yeah, well, it's it's just another example of. Beijing's very pernicious use of propaganda uh, to try to coerce or threaten others. Um, it's demonstrative, I think, certainly to you know the needs of the United States. Um, but I would I would say absolutely every other nation uh, in the region takes pause from from such propaganda. Yeah. So I mean, it really uh, to me adds a kind of a real world real world underscore of what you're saying. This is not a notional or hyped or theoretical threat. The uh, you know the, a threat, as you know, is capability and intent. They've developed the capability, and they're even putting out videos suggesting what their intent is. So uh, we don't have to be uh, super sluice here to realize that we've got a, a real problem on our hands. Um, you've been specific, uh, very specific, in calling for a particular system to provide that air and missile defense capability in Guam. Uh, specifically, saying that you believe Aegis Ashore, the Aegis Ashore system is what our, our citizens and warfighters need there. For viewers who may not be familiar with Aegis Ashore, if you wouldn't mind, what is it? And why do you believe you need that specific system? Yeah, uh, thank you for that, Brad. Um, you know, it's been an uh, interesting discussion uh, on this. You know, first, the most important thing is uh, Aegis, the, that system, you know, we have um, nearly 40 years of experience with in the field. And it has uh, it has demonstrated itself to be extraordinarily adaptive. Uh, for those who don't know, you know, as Aegis was um, originally uh, developed, it was meant to intercept long-range Soviet bombers before they could launch their uh, anti-ship uh, cruise missiles and nuclear weapons against our carrier strike groups. And as the eras have moved from the Soviet era to the post as a storm area, you know, that system was adapted to be able to intercept, detect, and intercept uh, cruise missiles, you know, so small and breaking just barely over the horizon at just, you know, single digit numbers of feet above the water. Um, I, I used to talk about all the time, you know, we are so capable with that system that we can detect essentially uh, what is amounts to the radar reflection of a flying soda can as it breaks over the horizon and interdict it. Then we adapted that to be able to interdict short range, medium range, uh, ballistic missiles. And you know, you're, if you're tracking what the Missile Defense Agency is uh, about to test here, they're gonna t uh, essentially test uh, the SM-3 missile, um, the latest iteration of the missile in the Aegis weapon system. Uh, against an intercontinental uh, representative threat. Um, so the Aegis system has proven itself to be extraordinarily adaptive. Sensing is there, the command and decision making, the weapons control is there, and then of course the magazines and the interceptors are there as well. But it's very important to think about Aegis Ashore not as a platform or a thing or a single point solution, but really as the key element of what would be a distributed architecture. 
And one doesn't need to look any farther than the Aegis missile defense uh, test site that's right over here in Kauai to understand that you can disaggregate the weapons and the magazines from the sensing and the command and control. <clears throat> that is going to prove itself extraordinarily powerful because already in ballistic missile defense, we rely on space sensing, we rely on a broad range of other sensing and networks, terrestrial radars and things like that. We're able and we have demonstrated that we can exchange information with important platforms like F-35s, fifth generation aircraft, and um, we'll be able to leverage this capability, which exists now. We fielded it in Romania, uh, we're building it in Poland. Um, uh, we are, have long demonstrated it at sea in order to put in place a 360 degree um, uh, multi-threat ballistic missile, the potential for hypersonic weapon threats, certainly cruise missile threats that would um, threaten Guam in order to, and the combination of solid state radar the baseline 10, uh, again, command and decision making and uh, weapons control, um, and the ability to disaggregate it into other defensive fires and, you know, potentially adapt offensive fires to it, like we already do at sea with Tomahawk, um, makes it an extraordinarily uh, capable system. Too many people are getting, you know, it's kind of interesting when we started this discussion, we talked about Homeland Defense System Guam, and people said, ah, I don't like that term because, you know, it implies that it's, it's new. Now we're seeing each of the short people say, well, well, we got that. And, you know, now I want, you know, something that is not um, uh, fieldable just yet, but might be deliverable by 2035. That's that's really not acceptable uh, to me. The threat is manifest now. We need to meet that threat by 2026. And each of the short delivers that to us. No, that's that's a great overview. Thank you. So some would push back and say, um, you know, Aegis, uh, so it, it, it will, for, for the viewers, it's persistent, right? And uh, because right now, as I understand, I'm not asking you to divulge any OPSEC here, but you know, we have at times Aegis vessels that are providing the protection, and the, but these ships are needed and can be used elsewhere, as you know better than me. But Aegis Ashore takes that same capability, puts it on land, frees up those vessels, and provides that kind of capability you've just described. But a critic or someone respectfully pushing back would say, but it's stationary. And by being stationary, that's a problem. And so therefore we should cobble together this or that other thing, um, almost suggesting that Aegis Ashore is intended to be the final uh, answer or, or, or a panacea. But that's not what I hear you saying. I hear you saying this is an important step that can meet the threat timeline. And then we're gonna build on that to do what else we need. Is that a good uh, summary of what I hear you saying? Yeah, I think that's acceptable, Brad. I mean, people so often in this business think there's a silver bullet that are going to solve all your problems, but it's actually the integration and the training and the joint force, kind of my four-legged uh, strategy there, that that makes it all so important. Um, Aegis capability at sea is a critical part of our maneuver force, and it's going to be needed um, to protect those maneuver and, and um, long-range fire assets, carrier strike groups, um, long-range... Uh, uh, Air Force assets and things like that, um, and forward and expeditionary um, bases that we don't know where they're going to be just yet. And uh, we need to preserve that capability going forward. And very importantly, a persistent site is a long-term demonstration to the region that we are a Western Pacific nation. We are one of the many nations that are concerned about the security in those regions. And, and we are putting forth the kind of deterrent capability that will prevent um, an easy, quick strike by an adversary. That's what that brings. Excellent. The um, We've talked a bit about it already, but zooming back out from Guam, uh, Dave Brown from Politico is also interested in, if you're willing, Admiral, in talking about the post-INF Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. We know that Russia cheated on that treaty for a long, long time. As a result, that treaty came to an end. And so that, uh, and, 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 and we have uh, Beijing that has developed a lot of these, uh, these same intermediate range capabilities because they were never bound by that treaty. Um, and so I'm interested if you're willing, obviously don't want, not gonna press you on locations or anything like that, of course, but uh, you know, um, 
what uh, what do you see as your needs and potential opportunities in terms of uh, our uh, intermediate range capabilities uh, to pr to really meet that key tenet of the national defense strategy and that is lethality yeah it's, uh, it's appreciate way, appreciate the way you articulated it uh, brad and uh, russia's been cheating on this for decades and china's never been a party to it. Uh, and in china's case they have a profound profound advantage when it comes to conventional ballistic missiles uh, of all ranges and types. Uh, we have to get into the long range fires game. Uh, I'm not gonna speak for any of my allies or partners in the region, but uh, I mean, you see some of the things that they're talking about in the open source press. I've been quite encouraged uh, by the United States developmental uh, trajectory, um, but you know, the important periods of risk are during transition times. We have to take advantage right now of the kind of capabilities we've already demonstrated in the sea, in the maritime, and with our Air Force, um, improve our capacity there, and then help deliver that kind of capability uh, to our ground forces um, to present the kind of strategic dilemmas uh, to potential adversaries in the region um, that um, are presenting those dilemmas to us. And, um, Times of transition are the very important times, and we have to get after this now. I'm so glad you said that, frankly, because as someone who watches kind of defense policy issues closely on Capitol Hill, one of my concerns, and I won't ask you to respond to this unless you want to, have all the services that are pursuing these very important research and development programs to modernize our force, something that we postponed for far too long as, as, as a nation. And now we're finally getting after it with a lot of these key modernization programs, programs that you clearly need and want. If we were to see a significant reduction in defense spending that prevented us from taking these research and development programs and fielding them to the warfighters that you help lead, uh, in my view, that just couldn't come at a, at a worse moment. So, it, you know, we really in the next, you know, two to five years range strikes me as a pivotal one to get right. And decision makers in Washington need to understand that if we get it right, if we give sufficient defense funding in the next two to five year time frame, when we can field these capabilities, it's going to have decades long uh, benefits for the U.S. and our allies in the region. No need to respond unless you want to on that. Um, the, uh, I, I had a please go ahead, please. I'm yeah, sorry. Mike. If you don't mind, I will, Brad. You know, two other important elements to it are the sensing that's going to be required in order to be able to deliver those fires and the networks to command and control it um, and the advances that are going to be really um, involved in the kind of, um, again, I'll just go back to, you know, this is an Aegis term, but command and decision making uh, when it comes to big data analysis and potentially artificial intelligence. We're going to want a person in the loop you know, to deal with the fog of war issues, um, especially in the nearest terms and, and the near term. Um, but we, we, it can't all be about what we call effectors. It's about sensing, it's about networks, and it's about the command and decision that, uh, making that has to um, go into that. And it's gonna take judicious um, investment in the next few years, um, no matter what the defense budget environment is like, in order to fully leverage um, the joint force capability and and create the advantage for us in the field. Yeah, well said. And as others have said more eloquently than me, it's it's really detect. Can we see what the adversary is doing? Can we determine how we need to respond? And can we deliver those effects? And so that's much more than a missile. That's a whole network that you're describing uh, that uh, that we're going to need to to field and field quickly. Had a discussion recently with Assistant Secretary Cooper. Uh, and I would just highlight that, you know, for the, the viewers, that's the Assistant Secretary of State responsible uh, for the Political Military Bureau at the Department of State, which is, has an important role in all this, of course. And uh, he's saying that, you know, the belligerence and provocation that we're seeing from Beijing uh, is, is, is encouraging allies and partners to come to us, wanting to do more with us. So it's not like us going around hat in hand, like you said, creating little Americas, you know, oh, please, please work with us to help us protect our narrow interests. It's, they see our, our interests is aligned and they're coming to us in many instances when it comes to basing and access and these sort of things. And that was a, a point that Assistant Secretary Cooper emphasized that I found, I found very encouraging. And I hope Beijing realizes that by pursuing this sort of aggressive foreign policy, 
uh, they're really uh, making, they're providing the best talking points necessary for why why these steps are necessary. It's not, you know, we want peace, and the best way to to, to have that is to be ready. And and they're they're uh, they're the ones that are creating uh, this need and interest in the, in the community to work more closely with us. If I may, Admiral, follow up real quickly on cruise missile defense. Um, would you be willing or, uh, to speak just briefly to the importance of on the first island chain in particular, uh, uh, making sure that we have sufficient cruise missile defense? Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely a requirement. And I, you know, you this is why you're, you know, we have this long partnership with uh, Japan and uh, Korea, you know, it's, it's just an example. I mean, they know uh, the capability set that Aegis brings to them um, and the ability to employ it. Um, is going to be critically important, not only to defend their maritime assets, but I think, you know, over time, you're going to see more and more cruise missile defense capability be a requirement um, for all nations, um, including ours, uh, which is why the, I'm such a key advocate for Aegis Ashore and Guam and, and the, the full slate of capability it can bring to you. That's great. And we've, we've hit on the quad a little bit already. But interested in, in any in any additional comments you have on how we can take this really important diplomatic grouping that is quickly becoming much more than that between the U.S., Japan, Australia, and India, and really take that to the next level in terms of uh, building effective defense capability and deterrent. Uh, yeah, anything you can share in kind of specific next steps for the Quad in terms of uh, military deterrence. Well, as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's, uh, it's quite pleased to see Secretary Pompeo um, meeting with uh, his counterparts uh, uh, this week um, to talk quad issues. Uh, I, you know, what I want to really tell you about the quad is uh, it's, it, 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 it must be, and, and frankly, uh, all the other elements that it can be are more important than making a security relationship out of it. You know, what those four countries can bring to bear in diplomacy, uh, in economic power, um, in um, the, the sharing of values that underline all the free and open Indo-Pacific visions that each nation has put forward, which are well overlapping. As I mentioned earlier, that's a great convergence. That'll actually be the most powerful aspect of it. Admiral, I think that's a great way to emphasize uh, uh, something I, I, I agree with, and that is that you know um, our foreign policy is much more than just defense. Uh, it's defense of what? Defense of our values, principles, and interests, and that's why we need a fully resourced and, and empowered uh, diplomacy and development, all the other tools of national power. So I'm glad you emphasized that. Uh, you know, with Japan, India, and Australia, we have those alignment on democratic values. But we're also seeing alignment on on security interests with 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 Vietnam, uh, as you know well, and uh, a lot of encouraging developments in terms of security cooperation with Vietnam. Tom Bowman at NPR is interested in any any thoughts you would have on what more we could be doing with Vietnam uh, in, to secure shared interests, uh, particularly in the South China Sea. Yeah, uh, Vietnam has been really the most vocal public uh, supporter of the idea of. Uh, of a free and open uh, Indo-Pacific um, and have been very supportive of um, our very specific freedom of navigation operations uh, within the South China Sea, but more importantly, very supportive of the international community's um, freedom of the seas operations, right? Their unquestioned uh, commercial and military access uh, throughout the South China Sea. Um, and in fact, all the South China Sea uh, claimant nations in their own ways, um, either privately or publicly, have been very supportive of the, again, commercial and uh, military access uh, within there. Um, the different levels of support you see in the public domain really is a result of the extreme pernicious approach that China takes to the region and the economic uh, and diplomatic threats that they give others and their ability to speak out there. Um, I've been quite encouraged by the international community uh, coming together, uh, multiple nations um, operating military forces independently within the South China Sea or in collaboration with one another and with us, uh, co-deployments uh, that we call them. Uh, the United States has you know, obviously been operating in there, but Australia, Japan, India, others uh, have all been operating in the South China Sea as well. 
Um, Vietnam and Southeast Asia um, are um, uh, in many respects um, the key to um, the free and open Indo-Pacific future. When you think about um, how we are trying to, and we, the United States, but all those Quad nations as well, how they're trying to engage that region of the world. At the center of it is ASEAN. Um, and those nations and their ability to stand up for themselves, um, the economic potential that's with all of them, the demography uh, of that whole region is gonna be critically important uh, to the globe over the years to come. Um, right now, um, we're in full support of um, Vietnam's work on the South China Sea uh, Code of Conduct negotiation. Um, they've been very influential within that. Um, we're very helpful in medical, um, in the remediation of UXO and um, toxins uh, in the region. And um, we'll continue to um, move forward with Vietnam at a pace that um, they can work. Um, and um, to the security of its nation um, and uh, to the value it brings to the international community there across uh, ASEAN and across Southeast Asia. Well said, it really gets to what kind of Indo-Pacific we all want. Do we want one ruled by the rule of law? Uh, where big and small, powerful and less, slightly less powerful are treated equally or is it might makes right? And uh, and I hear you just saying that we're uh, unambiguous and that we stand with the rule of law. And we have a lot of a lot of partners and allies in the region that agree with that. Uh, Admiral, you've been generous with your time. I've asked a lot of questions. I don't want this to feel like the Spanish Inquisition. I, I wanted to give you a chance to uh, close with anything else you'd like to say. Uh, what Americans should know about the uh, men and women that you lead there. A message to the, to the troops. Anything you'd like to conclude with? Uh, thank you, Brad, for the time today. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to engage on this and very much appreciate the questions of uh, your peers there across the United States, uh, across the, the area there. Uh, wish you the best of health. Everybody uh, stay safe back here in Washington. I look, to, I look forward to seeing you all in person as, as soon as we all can. Thank you. Admiral, same to you and the men and women you lead. Thank you so much for standing between us and those who wish us ill. Uh, thanks for your service and your bravery. Uh, thank you personally for your decades of service to our country and your continued leadership in the Indo-Pacific. Um, I wish you the best. Thank you again. Thank you, Brad. For our audience, this concludes our discussion. Thanks for watching. For more from FDD's Center on Military and Political Power in our China program, please visit us at fdd.org. Thank you again.